So a number of years ago, um, I uh, and my wife uh, did a year of service. It was just after college, about a year after college, in Kenya with a group called Young Adults and Global Mission. It was a Lutheran service uh, organization. And uh, so we lived with these 160 kids in an orphanage. And uh, they had a saying at this orphanage. It was a very faith-filled place. It was run by a church. And they always like to say, and you might have heard this before, uh, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. And they'd break it up into two parts where someone would say, God is good, and everyone would say, all the time, and then they'd say, and all the, th and all the time, God is good. Do we want to try that? Let's try it. So I say, God is good, and you say, all the time, and I say, all the time, God is good. Yeah? God is good. All, all the time. time. And all the time. God is good. Yeah, so they said that all the time. And uh, it was interesting to me uh, experiencing it because you could feel the, the love and the faith and, and the, you know, the, the neat things in that community. But it always, you know, kind of at first uh, confused me that of all people in the world, uh, this group of 160 orphans would be the ones saying this mantra. Uh, because if you think about it, when you think about what can happen to you in life, what kind of life you could live, uh, being born an orphan in a third world country uh, where you're really struggling to survive and, and where you have to be taken into this big uh, orphanage is not maybe the one that if we got to choose our life's course, that's the one we would choose. And, you know, I think I've met a lot of people who are quite wealthy who live in a country like this who might have a mansion who would not uh, say that mantra. And yet this was something they said, and they said it with passion and energy. You know, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. And uh, over time, uh, I got to see some stories in them and, and maybe start to understand why they were able to say this. Um, I remember the stories of two kids particularly. Uh, they were two brothers. One was named Sammy. He was, uh, well, I think by the time we met him, he was like 10, and his brother was like uh, 14, but uh, the or maybe 15. But uh, the the lady who ran the place once told us the story of Sammy and Benson. Uh, they shared that for some. Uh, I don't remember the exact circumstances, but for some reason, like many of the kids there, they had lost all their parents, all their family support. Uh, maybe they had died from AIDS, maybe they, something had happened, uh, I don't know, but they had lost their parents and they were so uh, unsupported that at age three for Sammy and at age six for Benson, they were out on the street alone uh, trying to survive, trying to do what they can. And this lady who ran the orphanage shared that for like six months, the older son Benson at age six took care of his younger brother age three. Uh, they lived in an abandoned building and he would just go out and beg and then bring food uh, to his younger brother and, and try to keep uh, both of them alive. Eventually the orphanage found them, thank God, and, and gave them a home. Uh, but what I came to realize, you know, thinking about stories like that, and there were lots of stories like that in this place, was that those kids could say God is good and all the time God is good uh, it, it, because they had gone through the shadow of death and they had gone through it. And that God, in some way, the experience of this loving church, which had or opened an orphanage, uh, in, in a very real way for them, God's goodness had saved their lives, right? So they had been through the shadow of death, and they had gotten through it. Well, we're now in our fourth week of this series we're doing called Christ in the Hero's Journey. We're looking at how Jesus' life follows this heroic story uh, that we find in lots of stories and literature and how we can learn from it in our lives. You know, the first week we explored how part of uh, being a person of faith and part of Jesus' walk was leaving what he knew and entering the unknown. Uh, the last week we talked about how there's a role for mentors who kind of embody uh, the love of Christ and help us along on our journey. And then this third week, we're looking at the theme, I'm calling it Entering the Abyss. Uh, but what this is about is facing the bad stuff of life, uh, facing the suffering, facing uh, death, facing evil. And if you look at hero stories, they always have to do this, right? Uh, you know, Dorothy eventually has to face the Wicked Witch of the West. Uh, Harry Potter has to face Voldemort. You know, whatever story you want to take, uh, people has to have to face the evil. And we all know know, if we know anything about the Christian story, that for Jesus, uh, the big thing he had to face was the cross, right? The cross was his moment more than any other where he had to face suffering and evil and death. And, uh, you know, if you think about unjust suffering, suffering that's not deserved, I don't know if there's a better example of it 
than Jesus Christ on the cross, right? If you think of Jesus, here comes the Son of God uh, who's been filled with the presence of God to live among us in humanity. And, you know, his mission has been all about love and service. He's been healing people who are sick. Uh, he's been bringing together outcasts and incasts and kind of making this society. He's been preaching a message of love. He's been feeding people who are hungry. He's been doing nothing but good things, you know, giving hope to people. And yet, what thanks does he get at the end of his life? Uh, he gets a, a bunch of people turning away from his radical love. Uh, he gets uh, people, uh, leaders conspiring to get him killed. And at the end, he gets a crowd who are shouting, crucify him. And I mentioned this last week too, uh, but we have this story from today, our gospel story, where we meet Jesus the night before his crucifixion, where he's saying a prayer on the Mount of Olives, and uh, his disciples are all falling asleep, they're tired, they obviously don't quite realize what he's, what's going to happen, even though he's been telling them over and over, and uh, he is about to face the cross, and he knows it. And the interesting thing is, even though he's the Son of God, like I shared last week, he's not excited about this either. Three times he prays to be spared, and three times God doesn't answer with any assurance that, yes, I'm going to spare you the cross. Uh, at the end, that's what has to happen. And at the end of the day, Jesus accepts this. He accepts, if I'm going to save the world, I'm willing to go to the cross. But the point is, he would have rather been spared, right? Suffering wasn't going to be fun for Jesus either. And this is true for us too, isn't it? We don't want to face the crosses in our lives. We don't want to suffer. You know, why would we want to suffer? We'd be crazy to intentionally chase suffering. And, uh, you know, when we are faced with suffering personally, or when we see it somewhere else, the thing that we always ask is, why does God allow the suffering. Uh, my little girl recently, she's only four, but is, there's like a, a certain time where pretty much every kid will ask you that question. Well, if God's so good, why, why does bad stuff happen? And all of us have asked this question, you know, why does bad stuff happen with a good God? And it's a great question, and the truth is, no theologian and no philosopher has ever been able to answer it to everyone's satisfaction. If I could do that for you, I'd be a very rich, famous philosopher, the pastor, you know, uh, I, I'd be front page in the news. Uh, but, you know, there are some things we can kind of put in our mindset to maybe help us understand a little bit of what's going on. The best I've heard is, I heard uh, one teacher say, you know, on the level of humanity and evil, in order to be able to say yes to God, we have to be able to say no to God. It's just, it's, it's the necessary reality. It would be like if you were proposing to marry to someone and you knew that they had to say yes. The yes wouldn't mean anything, would it? It would just be robotic. Uh, you know, so we have to be able to say no. There has to be the opportunity for evil if there's the opportunity for good. And in a wider sense too, true life demands a certain level of freedom in the world. You know, I think all of us, when we're kind of mad at God for, for their being suffering, for their being evil. I think we have this fantasy world in our heads where all the joy, all the love, all the good stuff surrounds us, but where there isn't any risk, where there isn't any bad stuff. But when you stop and think about what would that world be, it's, it's not clear that God could create a world of blessing and, and wonder and beauty without also creating the possibility of evil, the possibility of risk. You know, what would that look like for God to create a risk-free uh, existence? I think about when I was a kid, uh, I have a very clear memory when I got my biggest bre uh, bone breakage was I was climbing a tree upside down and I remember I was thinking I was Robin Hood. I was like five years old and I was like singing a song about Robin Hood and, uh, and you know, I lost my, my, uh, my hold and I fell on my wrist and I broke my wrist. And you know, when you're a parent, you learn that there's lots of things that kids love doing that are dangerous, you know, like climbing trees. It's kind of a rite of passage for kids, but as I learned, it's a dangerous thing. And you know, as a parent, you really want to keep them safe. You don't want your kids to get hurt. But you also realize that you cannot control every risk factor in their life. And I guess you could stop them from ever climbing trees, but that's kind of a rite of passage for kids, right? Is to get to climb trees. And if you think about it to its extreme, if you really wanted to protect your kid from all physical danger, you know, the only thing you could do would be to like lock them up in their closet and not ever let them go out. That would be physically safe, I guess. Not very mentally safe, but physically safe. Uh, but it wouldn't be life, would it? 
And I think that's somewhat of what's going on with the universe, that you know, in order to have beauty, in order to have possibility and freedom, there has to be the risk of things going wrong. So that's a partial answer maybe to why bad stuff happens. It might help the head a little, but I know full well that that doesn't really help the heart when you're in the midst of suffering. Uh, because you can't logic your way out of suffering. It's not as if you suffer and then someone gives you an explanation. You're like, oh, now I don't hurt anymore. You know, that's not how it works. Um, I remember when I was training to be a pastor, I had this supervisor uh, who worked at a hospital and I, I worked at the hospital with him. And we hung out one time and we were kind of talking about suffering and evil and you know I was talking about you know I'm interested in kind of thinking about why it is and why it happens and he used the expression it's like peeing in the wind you know it's pointless which is not a very pastorly uh, description but that's what he said he was a pastor it's like peeing in the wind trying to figure out why bad stuff happens it happens uh, maybe the more mature question eventually isn't so much you know can I understand why it happens but what do I do with my suffering? What do I do with the evil? What do I do with the bad stuff? Because we don't really have a choice in facing it. You know, it's gonna face us whether we like it or not, but what do we do with it? And the Christian answer has always been that we offer our brokenness, we offer our pain, we offer our suffering to God. We offer the wounds that we get in life to Christ, and we wait for Christ to transform them in some meaningful way. Right? We, we give them to him and we wait. And waiting is hard. You know, that's not the fun part of it. That's the second half of suffering. It's not just suffering, but it's waiting for something to happen out of suffering and not being sure if we can trust that God is going to do something with our suffering. That's why St. Paul says today in our other reading, he says, We know that the whole of creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly while we wait for adoption the redemption of our bodies. And I think his point here is partially hope, right? That we we're waiting for redemption. We've seen the first fruits in Christ. We trust in it. But it's also this acknowledgement that it's like labor pains. I've never had labor pains, but I'm told they're painful, right? <laughs> Some of you can tell us. Uh, but I understand often labor pains are incredibly painful. And that's what St. Paul is saying. It's painful to wait for God, uh, to wait for this day when someday uh, God will give us peace and tranquility uh, in, in the presence of God. And, you know, if you've ever been hit by serious suffering, whatever it might be, whether it's an illness, uh, whether it's the loss of a loved one, whether it's just your life falling apart in one way or another, uh, it can feel like it's just never going to end. It can feel like it is the end. You know, nothing is going to get better. But the amazing thing is, uh, and, and you can't believe it at the time always, but you look at other people who've gone through tremendous suffering and you see that most of the time people get through it. They may be wounded, uh, they may continue to carry certain scars, you know, physically, emotionally, in their lives, but people get through it. And especially people who trust in God can have a sense of meaning in the midst of that. And God can even do something with that suffering. That's amazing. And that's the remarkable thing about God. You know, if we look at the cross, it's this ultimate symbol of everything that's bad. It's ugly, it's death, it should be the end, and yet it becomes the beginning of a new life for the world, a new possibility, this message of love. And that's not to say that the things that we suffer are good. You know, sometimes, you know, we, we tell each other, everything has a purpose, and so, you know, it's almost like your suffering is good if really something bad happened to you. I don't think that's the point. It's not that your bad stuff is good. It's just that your bad stuff can lead to something good. You know, it says in, in the Bible in lots of ways, you know, Jesus doesn't like our suffering any more than we do. Jesus doesn't want to give us suffering. Uh, Jesus came to someday put an end to our suffering. But the cross, again, does mean that God can use the bad things in our life to bring about beautiful, life-giving things. He can, just, he can transform our suffering into new life. One of the really great books of the last uh, 50 years written by this, this writer uh, is called The Wounded Healer. And I remember I read the book. I don't remember much about it, but I always remember that title, The Wounded Healer. And his whole point in the book is that in order to be 
effective healers, spiritually speaking, uh, it, it's actually necessary for us to carry wounds. Otherwise, we don't understand anyone that we're healing. Uh, being wounded makes us useful healers to others who are wounded now. There's another book, you might have read it, kind of an old one from the early tw uh, 20th, 20th century called The Prophet, written by this kind of Christian mystic guy. He had this beautiful line, I, I'm going to paraphrase it, but it basically said, the sorrow in your heart carves out a cup that later holds the compassion for others. And, and that's what it feels like to hurt. It's like having part of your heart carved out, but that, that space that's carved out can actually become compassion for others. If you've ever met people who've had cancer, and we all have, uh, and if you ever see someone who gets a recent diagnosis, have you ever noticed, I saw this in a friend, he had prostate cancer, and then uh, within a few months someone else had prostate cancer, and who's that person with the cancer going to for healing, for advice, for support? It's the one who suffered in the same way. A woman with breast cancer, right? You find other women who've had breast cancer, cancer and you find healing and support in that way. The whole program of Alcoholics Anonymous and all help groups, they're based on that system. If you are suffering, if you're wounded, come find healing in the presence of other people who are suffering, who are wounded. As we've been doing our studies in between services, uh, this week we've been looking at, uh, and last week, uh, a video about St. Francis. A lot of people feel that St. Francis, this incredible saint, probably got closer to Christ than anybody. Uh, I mean, he just, he, when lepers could give you horrible diseases and everyone would avoid them, he was hugging them and welcoming them in. He was helping uh, people who were hungry. He didn't have any possessions. He just gave up everything. He's incredibly trusting of God. And you think, oh, he must have just been born this nice little kid and just perfect all along. Well, that's not the case. Uh, we were hearing in a story, uh, there was this awful war between these different Italian uh, city-states, and he participated in it, participated in horrible violence, and ended up in prison for like a year. And it was during that suffering period of waiting and being in this awful dungeon that he had a vision from God which transformed his life. And I think a lot of times when we hear a story like that, we think, isn't that amazing that such an experience of suffering can lead to such a person of compassion and, and purpose? And actually, it is amazing, but it's also not amazing. That's how the cross works a lot of times. It's the suffering in our lives that teaches us to serve others, uh, to heal others. And so today, as we think about Christ and the hero's journey, uh, we, we pay attention to Jesus' own journey, how he went to the cross, how he gave us new life through it. And we, we trust, even though it's hard to trust, we trust that when we're facing the cross of our lives, that that's leading to something meaningful. And that part of that meaningfulness is that Christ is going to teach us to serve others. And even though none of us want to go to that cross, there's life beyond it. And we can trust that and find meaning and joy in that too. Amen.